Then, uh, hello, uh, my name is Marcel. Uh, I'm from, this time from the to-do group, I would say. <laughs> I tell you in a minute. Um, and uh, I welcome you to this talk uh, and thank you for your patience and being really, I think it's one of the latest or even the, the, the final one uh, that we have now. Uh, but we are also glad that we got this, uh, this slot because um, in the to-do group um, we prepared a guide explicitly and here is really the place to go, OSPOCON for other OSPOs. So we are from OSPOs to OSPOs. That's a little community that we started here uh, within the to-do group Europe. And uh, uh, we thought, okay, what, what can we do uh, to help out other OSPOs? And we had a list of topics, and one of those topics was then the outbound open source. Um, so first of all, uh, you might be uh, uh, a little bit puzzled, because here you have Siemens on the slides. Uh, here you have someone else from another company. Uh, here I'm really presenting to do exactly uh, uh, today the to-do group. And here the, the guide itself. Here also all the, 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 uh, the merits to Anna. And, and Michael, Cornelius, and uh, Joseph, and, and Oliver, Oliver, who, who wanted initially to present here, but unfortunately didn't have the, uh, the possibility to come here. So I'm kind of jumped in, and so I'm happy that we can also present what, uh, and, and give you the news what happened, and also share the link. So it's all online. Uh, so, and in the presentation, we will just go through uh, the, the chapters a little bit so that you get an overview, and also that you can judge how you can use it. Uh, so as you see, I'm merely one of those uh, reviewers, uh, but I'm then also glad to, that I can contribute something to the community by presenting this here. As uh, Cornelius would also have liked to join, but he had to catch his flight, so, he's, uh, so this slot was just too late. Um, it's CC by SA40, uh, so everyone is also then uh, uh, can use the stuff and also feedback, so it's really meant also to be, potentially it's a run zero if you find any bugs, if you have any uh, additions, then, then you're welcome. And the agenda is very simple, because uh, in the guide we have an introduction, uh, we have one part where we talk about contributions to existing projects, so this is typically as what you start with, yeah, so you come from usage, you potentially know these cascades, yeah, you use it, then uh, you have a lot of developers coming to the, your office and say, hey, we also need to contribute, we need to contribute. Then uh, we try to compile some hints in this section and then starting an open source project, so either, um, yeah, for whatever reason, so we go through this also in the introduction, what could moti mo be motivations, also perhaps that could help you also to judge that better within your organization. And um, yeah, uh, let's directly s uh, start there with the motivations. And perhaps before I go through this list, a motivation, what, what could be the have, have been the motivation for us, as you have seen all the contributors there, um, where we thought, okay, on the one side, it's uh, f for the community a win if we can enable all the organizations to have also the possibility and do not have the same learning curve than we had, but potentially we can help you with this guide to have a steeper learning curve there, uh, that you do not need to do the iterations that we did. So therefore you're welcome to, to look at this on the one side so that we have even more organizations, companies that could then join in our communities. On the other side, this is the second effect also for the second part of it, uh, creating and maintaining new projects, uh, because then all of us as consumers might be concerned, like because if we can start them from the beginning with a high quality, then we also profit all of, of it, because then in the consumption, the OSM reviews will be much easier if that's already nicely uh, yeah, formatted, if we have the licenses in place and so on, and we can really trust in, in the material. So that has those two, two aspects. But for you as, as, a, uh, as an organization, so there you, have, you might have different reasons why you want to either contribute to existing projects or say, okay, now we need also to, um, yeah, to launch our own project or, or we see a, a reason or 
ideally our business says, hey, that would be a good idea to really use open source as a business. I think that would be one topic in our to-do group list that we should tackle in the next month. So uh, also to um, approach our, our business um, owners and the budget owners, so, and also to get a better feeling um, how, what, what makes sense to open source and what not. But here there are also the, the range of reasons that you can read here, just like, okay, yeah, uh, the developers, they do not want to uh, maintain internal patch branches, but they want to contribute upstream, so that would be a very well uh, obvious uh, um, a reason or a motivation to do this. Or you have here the, the ideas in yeah, pushing standardization or getting influence in existing or new topics, building ecosystems uh, right away. And there's, in the introduction, you will find that a nice compilation. It's potentially uh, not um, complete, but yeah, uh, you have there also some, some arguments potentially to think about in your company. For me, my, uh, my favorite is the fourth bullet point on the left side, improve quality and boost developer skills by peer review. So my personal observation there is, uh, and this is uh, by core experts. So this is what I observe uh, on the developer side that there's a big motivation uh, for developers because they, they love to learn from seniors, right? And if you have really um, good projects and, and uh, with, with a lot of seniors also as maintainers, this is really where they can uh, grow up and, and learn and, and, and uh, evolve their, uh, their skills. And I think this is something as an argument within a company, say, okay, also for your HR, so hmm, why are we not an attractive employer, right? So why uh, do we have that situation? I think that's something that's uh, slowly coming uh, as, a, as a big argument and also in the, in the whole community. Um, now to the first uh, part of the guide about contribution to existing projects. So here, why do we need here also uh, to, to have something? Uh, here, as yeah, most of the contributors from Germany, so we know uh, Germany uh, very well, but also as a disclaimer, none of us is a, is a lawyer, right? So please also, if you want to um, use that within your organization, please also check that with, you, with your lawyers. It's just a compilation of um, kind of good practices. But here, this is the point that in case we contribute that something, it's uh, also considered as a gift, right? And uh, we do not give away what doesn't belong to us, right? And as an employee, uh, the employer IP doesn't belong to us, right? It's all by these, uh, by these laws, for example, uh, that everything you do in your work uh, scope, the scope of work belongs to your employer in Germany. And therefore, you need to, well, then get also an approval. And this is what you need to understand because also perhaps uh, new developer to this topic might see that or observe that. Um, yeah, why do other organizations do this, uh, this in that way? Uh, so that is also important and therefore I love this, this guide because you can also point uh, developers or people that want to know the background of that, just point them to this and see, and then they can read also in this chapter, look, this is what we need. And this is nothing that you tell them or uh, someone tells them, but this is really now um, a collection that we did from other companies, from other organizations, that it's not a, a homemade uh, thing, but this is just uh, the, um, the environment in, uh, where we need to work in and we need to adhere to the, to the law and we, we need to be compliant. And, and, and that's what I observe is also um, something where the awareness at the developer side is, is uh, quickly rising and then they accept it. And then the question is, okay, now how can we do that more efficient? So here we also mainly stay at the what and why level, but for the how level, I think that we still have potential also to, in the community um, to work on, on things. And here's an example, for example, how uh, something internally could look like. So here you see this is um, very interesting because if you talk about contribution, a developer put, 
pot would potentially think about, okay, I contribute to a project, so I make a pull request, the pull request is reviewed, then it's emerged to the repository, right? Um, from a company, pers a company perspective, that looks like this. And if you go from the left side to the right side, you have a lot of steps that you need to go through. You need to check a lot of things. And you didn't do not any step here that really is the pull request to the upstream project, right? Uh, and this is also something uh, you need to take into account that, well, you have to have this transparent uh, to be safe, not only to protect your organization, and that's what the, uh, the developers also need to know. It's also for protecting them, yeah, to have that, that um, uh, very transparent. And um, here, this is what you can say, okay, here, look, this is from another company or another organization. Is nothing that we invented to uh, to make you annoying, <laughs> uh, but this is something that needs to be done. Here we have a lot of um, roles that need to be uh, involved. We need to check uh, potentially contracts, things like that. Always depending um, on the on the situation, but there are a lot of steps up front that you need to be. Uh, that need to be prepared. And here, we're not talking about creating a new project, right? This is if you want to contribute to an existing project. And as this might really be a hassle or, or not very efficient uh, to do that for every contribution, uh, there's also in the, in the guide uh, also a section that talks about different models that you could use, right? So here on the left side, you see, well, that would all developers, right? For all developers, you would need to go through all those steps. But on the right side, we, we see then the senior developers, developers that have already, where we have potentially already trust in them and they have a lot of experience. So where you can also, uh, in your organization, set, set up a model where you can say, okay, now here we can make that a little bit leaner uh, and have a major to major release or even a full trust model. But that's also potentially depending on your management how well they want uh, want to do this is just to do have that complete. It's not the one and only, uh, but you have also uh, flavors how you can um, implement that within your company uh, or or your organization. And this is also part of the guide uh, in one section. And um, then, uh, as I said, with uh, these internal procedures, we need as we are paid also by our organizations, we want to protect our organization. But on the other side, we also need to have an eye on our employees, right? We need to protect them as well. And this is a, a section that is potentially interesting because we have employees that already work, potentially when, when you hire them, they already active in open source projects or uh, they might find out, okay, they would be interested in other, um, in, in other projects uh, in their, in their, while they're working. So, yeah, it's uh, um, not in scope of their work. Uh, so the, here in Germany, the Copyright Act is a little bit strange, so you have to need, uh, read it on your own. But what I want to say is, okay, you need to have transparency. When is the developer working for the company and therefore producing company or organization IP? And when does it does he or she produce own IP, right? Because then you need, in case of that's organization IP, we have seen an example. You have to go through all those steps. If it's the developer's own IP, then he can do well whatever he wants with his IP. The problem is if this is very uh, or the challenge, let's say <laughs> like this. If this is very obvious, I always take this as an example. For example, you have a software developer who's also in a photographer, and he's in a photographer community, and his work has really no overlap at all with this sharing about uh, ideas and specialist things about photography. Yeah, then it's very clear. Uh, so nevertheless, might be potentially uh, make sense to nevertheless make that transparent. But if the closer those uh, those topics get, uh, the the more you need to check that you have this transparency, that you have the documentation, also in the interest of the of the uh, um, developer, right? That say that he knows. Okay, I, I that's really my IP that I contribute to that to that project. And here, um, 
as you can see, that um, you can make it very formal or not. Uh, but here I would um, say from what you read, my, my main point here is really this transparency um, that you should have in this case um, in your organization. And the, the more you can mature this process, it's even possible to say, okay, you have potentially uh, a project that is um, that the developer contributes in his private time, and then you might have a phase where he wants to contribute in his work time and then switching back to private time. So we had situations like that. And then exactly there, it's, it's uh, very important to say, okay, uh, I have the transparency until this date. It was company IP until from this day to that day. This was his own IP and so on. So this, this is possible, but you need to, well, keep that in mind and also have a, a good process and, and the documentation to have that transparent. Um, and so you see uh, that's part of our learning curve, right? Is <laughs> when we started this, we potentially didn't uh, think at all of this. So therefore, the guide could also help you to keep that in mind um, to if you set up something for your organization. So now, contribution is also something that you will need in the last in the second part about starting an open source project because once you start it, then you will potentially also have your developers uh, contributing to this, but starting an open source project has then also uh, additional yeah, things you need to care of. And um, then we thought about how to structure this. And I think uh, the guide is, is uh, used now with a very nice structure because we use the life cycle of such a project as uh, in, in, in a chapter. So uh, here in the planning phase, it will start, then you will have an active phase, a mature phase, and then the end of life obsolete phase. And uh, so because typically, well, you have enthusiastic developers that just want to, yeah, open source something on GitHub or GitLab or whatever. Uh, and I think in this case, then you can also just point them to the life cycle. So you should also think, please, to host life cycle. So what happens? for example, after the active phase when you're not there anymore and we have questions and you're, I don't know, promoted to a managed position, whatever. So who cares then about that? Uh, and also then in the end of life, so if really, well, it's, it gets outdated, what happens then? So these are all things that you need uh, to care. And in e each phase, you have then also specific points that you need to care of. Uh, so, and if you go through the guide and you say, ah, no, I'm in the planning phase, what do I have to check? Or I'm in the active phase, what are things that I, I need to check? You will see in the, in the guide then. And um, so here uh, in the planning phase, uh, some questions which need to be answered. And this is then also perhaps something um, uh, when typically people come to you in the, in the OSPO and say, hey, yeah, we want to open source something. Uh, then, well, what do you, why? <laughs> why want you, would you do this? And uh, what problem do you solve? Um, what values provide this project to others so that you please think about that first, right? And then the fourth point is, well, did you already check if this is, there is already a project or a community that does this? Uh, no, yeah, yeah, please, uh, please do this because in this case, then we can just uh, go back to the first chapter. Uh, well, then we, we just, yeah, analyze that project and improve it, and then we can contribute an existing and join forces with the existing community. And this is, I would say, uh, a high, in a high the, um, number, what, what typically happens. <laughs> uh, so if we would have really uh, created all the projects where the people said, yeah, we want to uh, create a project, we would have created much, much more. Uh, but the fourth question typically made it, right? So that, uh, um, the, the first three uh, questions typically are not answered by the developer, but by your business, for example, or your, your software strategy that creates a, a software strategy, uh, an open source strategy, where the business says, okay, yeah, we need to create an ecosystem around something, or we need to join forces with others. Um, and um, yeah, then also, as I said, so here, um, this is, also going beyond compliance, I would say, yeah, because someone 
uh, needs to run this. So it's not that you make a cold drop and then it's out there. So you also have to check out all this. Uh, you will see this in the, uh, I think it's uh, also summarized there, but in the guide um, um, about, yeah, what license, uh, CLA, yes, no, DCO, whatever. So you have to lot a lot of, um, yeah, a uh, kind of framework around the project that you need to uh, to create. So you can create that once, but it's also, it needs to be maintained and the maintenance is not for free, right? So if you're lucky, then uh, well, it, uh, the community uh, starts through and, and you can profit then also from, from collaborative maintenance. But uh, nevertheless, it's, it's good if you have a long-term funding already uh, clarified. And uh, then also, uh, as I said, uh, also the, con the ability to contribute in the first section, yeah, that must be there, so because otherwise you will drop your code, but none of your <laughs> developers from the organization is, or is, is ready, is trained, whatever. So the whole setup needs to be, uh, be there. And there's also in the, in the guide, you will find some, some hints about how, uh, what you need to prepare first. Yeah? Already in the, uh, in the concept phase, and um, then after launch, um, this is something where uh, you may or may not come very, very quickly to the last, end, uh, the last uh, phase of the life cycle uh, if you not have in mind that, well, such a community doesn't uh, create it itself. Uh, you really also need to invest not only in the code, but you also need to invest in the people and marketing, community management. So this is also a very important point. Uh, also, um, yeah, I, I like the last point that, that Oliver entered here. It's all about transparency, consistency, predictability, visibility, appreciation. So uh, each of those points, I think we can uh, could talk <laughs> about very, very long, but if, if for example, uh, you just drop the code without any documentation, so well, it will not be very attractive for others to contribute. Um, if they're, for example, also very important, uh, you want to um, yeah, contribute back, bug fixes, and it's very intransparent what happens and why it's, uh, it's not accepted, things like that. So there, therefore, it's also, there's a, there's a people uh, aspect in, in this as well. So that should not be underestimated. Okay, and uh, so here, um, this is the, the summary for the, uh, I opened also the, the other, the, the guide itself. So here, uh, just for, where's my mouse here, that you can see. Well, this is really, really <laughs> small. Uh, I think I will, I will share this later then in the talk, uh, but it's in the uh, to-do group. Uh, in the guides, uh, to do group slash guides slash outbound OSS. And uh, here you see we have one online uh, version, but you can also here directly go to the PDF. I think it was also linked in the, in the description. Um, and yeah, as I said, we, we went through the, the chapters. So the introduction chapter is also, I think something worth to read for not only for the OSPOs, but uh, developers or your business that could have a look at, uh, at it. And then uh, here, as I said, the uh, one chapter about the contribution uh, to existing projects. Um, and here then the uh, starting a new project. And at the end also there was um, a collection of well, technical uh, considerations, tooling, best practices. And I think this is also something where we uh, then, I would expect that once you uh, hopefully will appreciate that and, and we get feedback so that at that point we can also grow the, the collection of good practices then. So it's a one zero, I like it to be honest. And I, I, uh, the, the best thing I like in it is I can really point to that and say, okay, this is not, <laughs> coming from me, but you can see there's also other organizations that uh, everyone needs to do this. This is uh, nothing uh, organization specific. And, um, and it, uh, yeah, it's a nice compilation. And now I would go to the questions if you have any. 
Yes? Well, the first question I was going to ask was the same question I asked in previous talks. Um, just like you've got uh, CLA assistance for Space Control people coming to see your project as science CLA, is there a tool for handling CLA to give science for other projects? But that points to the Kudu Group um, Autumn Ospo research, where there's mention of that spot. So, first question answered by the doctor who wrote. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, the merits go to all the authors, yeah, yeah. not to me. I'm just presenting. Yeah. <laughs> my, my second question is, um, the DCOs are basically a standard document. Has, is there a standardization for CLAs as well? Because last time I looked a couple of years ago, they were sort of standardizing around a pattern, which was very much, please print this thing out and, and post it to us, which is horrific. That's a very good question. So the question was about, is there a standard for uh, also for CLAs? And we had this discussion in when we prepared uh, this guide. And uh, we, um, well, no one was really amused from all the participants <laughs> because uh, a CLA is a contract, right? And uh, a contract you need then always to involve your, your lawyers from your company. And, and therefore we said, okay, it would have been a dream to just have, well, a standard contract that's already pre-approved by, by our lawyers. Um, and, uh, and therefore we said, no, but then uh, that somehow, for whatever reason, you would need this, right? Uh, and because we have this DCO, and we thought, okay, perhaps we, we should start also an initiative to say, um, I, I think it, nearly everyone in the run said, okay, well, we would, potentially not invest in this uh, route to go via the legals and doing all this, this, this. If the business will tell us, okay, there are millions, if we may contribute to that project with the CLA, then yes. But if it's like we want to do a bug fix there, uh, you see the, the cost benefit ratio is, is not there, right? So, and if you as a, as a company or organization want to really, uh, keep away organizations <laughs> contributing to your projects, then you make a CLA. Because this is really a, an unnecessary additional hurdle for us as OSPOs uh, to go through this, because this is very, very expensive, a lot of effort to do this. And therefore we said, okay, we will keep that very short at that point, and rather than telling, okay, that's the situation, full stop, right? And um, the other thing is, uh, when do you potentially have a CLA is, okay, you, you really uh, host something as an organization on your own. Uh, and here personally, I could say, okay, but why not go to a foundation, right, that already has, for example, uh, a global CLA, like we use a lot clips, yeah? So then you do this CLA check once and then you're done for all the other projects. Same potentially for, for other uh, foundations and then you have a neutral, uh, a neutral host, right? So that contributing to an open source project from another organization might also feel a little bit strange for companies like contributing in another company's uh, repository. So, and as it's open source, so, and we have those foundations, why not leveraging that? Uh, so therefore we said, okay, we could have really uh, w go into de that detail, but, uh, um, so the, I think there was consensus that we just give a hint, okay, that exists, but uh, we see there are uh, better ways uh, to, to handle this from the side if you start an open source project. If your company would really assist, uh, insist on this, well then go for it and, and check it out. But uh, I would say the best practice would be, okay, uh, if I not already have, uh, already have a community where I said, okay, that, that fits, for example, here in this and this Eclipse or Linux or Apache community that's already there and that potentially already comes with a legal framework that is, was pre-checked by a legals. There must be really good, good, good arguments to set up all this uh, on your own. So no CLAs, please. <laughs> <laughs> Foundation CLA is 
So the, 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 I try to repeat it, so the, uh, it seems that uh, CLA, ICLA, CCLA, it's also covered, I think, in the, in the, in the guide. And then uh, the corporate CLA uh, is, is uh, well, foundation CLA is still, well, kind of acceptable, but uh, the corporate CLA is potentially a nightmare. And uh, <laughs> uh, so that was was uh, the, <laughs> the the feedback in here, uh, but I I would say yes, uh, yeah, at least from from the uh, internal checking because you really have to go through things and uh, and potentially also uh, legals from your organization checking with the legal from the other organization um, and so on and so on. So it's it's really yeah, it's uh, I think. For the lawyers, it's good because then they have a lot of work, right? But uh, if you really want to, um, yeah, bring your your topic forward, then it's it's a, a hurdle where you really need to think uh, about if is it really worth. Yeah. Or or there might be reasons why uh, that you need to protect something like that. But typically, you will find CLAs in a very specific context um, where you need to think if if you also want to um, be in such an ecosystem. Dual licensing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you want, you want to be able to make sure that you can still release RO and IP under RO license as well as under the other dual license? Yeah. Yeah, this is um, uh, the, to repeat that, so uh, one of those motivators for uh, an organization might be to offer dual licensing and I say, okay, I want to uh, have a, um, a community edition, I guess, yeah, that the community can work on. But in the same time, I also want to use that in the enterprise edition in my products as, as an organization. So therefore, I need to handle that somehow that I get then also the right from each contributor by this CLA signed by his company that the IP from that company may be used in my products and so on. So this is really yeah, <laughs> something you, you can make your own studies yeah, about. Yeah, so the, um, the hint here, the feedback was that uh, it's also confusing if uh, it's based, for example, on existing known um, um, CLAs like the, like the Apache, uh, and then modify, right? <laughs> uh, plus, uh, I guess, uh, jurisdiction... Uh, Mm. Which is like in case of Apache Foundation, you know that it is an open source project. But in case of the corporation, if you talk about the product, then it's not thinkable. Yeah. The I, I'm trying to summarize. So the the problem that in yeah, and that's a good hint. Uh, in case of a CLA uh, made for an open source project, where it's very clear what is the product. Right, because it talks about this open source project. If you use the same CLA and put it in another context where you need to define first what in this proprietary context means the product, right? And that might create confusion. So as I said, there might be easier setups uh, to tackle with and, and uh, th that's what I meant. So for us, it's, it's very clear and I think um, OSPOs, well, that's also, you come to the office in the morning and they say, well, this is an interesting topic to, to work today or the next weeks. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, then you will have uh, the developers who says, but I want to, <laughs> I want to contribute my bug fix. It's a one-liner, right? So, uh, and you have fun for weeks, but I want to have that uh, fixed for tomorrow. Uh, and then you need to explain all this, right, to a developer. And so therefore, I really love this, as you can just make a pointer here and look here. Um, that's that's the way it be, and then potentially we could have a, a little info box about this CLA in a uh, in a proprietary context uh, to that they yeah if you're done with reading then you will know why uh, yeah potentially uh, 
we will not uh, not be able to do this in, in the next next days, but it will rather take more days or even weeks or even months, yeah, depending on. Uh, and then also a lawyer is potentially not cheap, yeah. So it's it's also then the question who pays all this effort, right, for this one bug fix. Uh, then, yeah, rather rather go with the internal patch branch in this case. Yeah. Okay, then uh, have fun reading it. And uh, uh, also here, as uh, I mentioned, your feedback is welcome. Contact us also. Uh, you can join us also in the to-do group. Uh, so where we publish this. And uh, yeah, hopefully this will be, uh, yeah, there are already some guides. So there we also have references to the other guys, be guys because we didn't want to have overlap or redundancy. So. Uh, and I think that's a good start and also to, to have that collection. Uh, so on the one side you will have, if you build up really a new OSPO for example, then you can start with the specification for open chain on the what and why. And then uh, you, we have guides in the to-do group about how and that could be then also some something in between because we said, okay, outbound open source in open chain is, mm, could have been done, but it yeah felt a little bit strange. So the, we said, okay, it's better to have that that guide here as an extra guide, um, even if it's rather on the what and why uh, than on the how level. Uh, but uh, I think it's it's a good start, and uh, hopefully it will be helpful to to many OSPOs and, and new OSPOs uh, to have a steeper learning curve than we had at, at that time. So thank you very much, and thank you for joining uh, my. Uh, final talk here, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, have a safe trip home, and uh, see you.